So uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the, uh, uh, the fabrication demand for the PGMs in China. And uh, we've started uh, uh, incorporating the Chinese data more uh, sufficiently in our uh, yearbooks and long-term reports starting from this year. And uh, today I'm going to talk more intensively about the uh, major sectors that are utilizing uh, PGMs, particularly auto and jewelry sectors. Uh, because these are the uh, major sectors. I'm going to touch a little bit on rhodium at the end of the presentation um, because it's a smaller market. So uh, let me begin by uh, talking about our uh, economic expectations for this year. Um, so uh, we are probably not going to see a uh, annual growth in GDP of, of 12, 14% as we've been seeing in the past decade. But um, the growth and the Chinese economy is still robust, and we are expecting a 9% real GDP growth for this year. And uh, the second, uh, for the remainder of this year, so earlier of next year, we're probably going to see a, more, a bit of moderation in Chinese real GDP growth. That is, after uh, many of the government's tightening measures take effect. And um, chances for a hard landing in the Chinese economy is highly unlikely. Um, inflation rates are uh, is expected to come up from the highest of 6.4, um, 6.5 percent we see in June and July. In August, I think it's 6.2 percent. Um, and that is likely to ease up for the remainder of this year or first quarter of um, 2012, but still at very elevated um, levels and in comparison to you know, some of the developed Economies, and that is likely to keep the uh, Chinese government's um, monetary uh, you know, economic tightening measures in place to run end the overheating of the Chinese economy. And that uh, moderation of the Chinese economy is um, reflected in the major industrial you know, and jury sectors that are utilizing uh, PGMs. It's, um, uh, so in the first half of this year, we're seeing imports uh, slow uh, on a year-to-year -year basis, 3.2% uh, up for uh, platinum, 4.7% for um, palladium, and minus 9.4% for uh, rhodium. And that is compared to double-digit um, uh, increase in, um, increase in um, uh, net imports from 2007 to, to 2010. Uh, net imports grew uh, on a compound annual basis uh, for 33% for platinum, 19.8% for palladium, and 9.3% for um, rhodium uh, um, between those years. Um, so even though we're seeing slower import growth um, in the first half, and this is on top of the rest growth and robust levels we've been seeing along those years, so it's um, displaying no cost for um, intense borrowing. And if we look at uh, fabrication demand for platinum, we're seeing positive but not uh, dramatic growth for this year. Um, in China, um, but still, we're seeing we're forecasting a uh, four point four percent growth in fabrication demand for platinum to about uh, two point three million ounces in this year, and this is mainly supported by positive growth in the jewelry and um, auto sectors, uh, which make up uh, around um, eighty percent of the total fabrication demand for platinum in China. And uh, jewelry is, of course, a major user of platinum, and China right now is the largest platinum jewelry uh, market in the world. It, its um, demand levels exceeded Japan in um, 2001, and uh, we've been seeing really rapid growth in the late 90s and very elevated um, consumption levels. Um, throughout much of the last decade, and the demand, which is uh, demand, is pretty much being kicked off by uh, a lot of the uh, successful marketing campaigns, uh, which are you know supported by the international organization. And the Chinese jewelry fabricators are uh, have been able to receive.
developed this market. Um, pretty much. And in 2009, we saw um, demand for platinum jewelry skyrocketed because of the lower prices and uh, because of the heavy promotion uh, along those years. And in 2010, there is a sharp decline. Uh, and in this uh, has to do with the um, elevated prices of the platinum. Also, uh, we are seeing uh, inflation levels have been um, hurting a lot of the purchasing powers for the consumers in China. And in addition, you have other options uh, for jewelry, such as gold jewelry, which is considered more of an inflation hedge and a form of invest investment for many of the uh, consumers. And this, um, uh, the, this relatively softness um, in uh, platinum jewelry demand also has to do with the types of platinum jewelry that is being consumed in China. And currently we estimate um, roughly half or more um, of the platinum jewelry that is being consumed in China are wedding jewelry. And these, uh, because platinum, you know, the metal, uh, the noble metal is being made into like rings, you know, the diamond rings and all the, you know, um, wedding jewelry that is very popular. It's, it's a favored uh, jewelry among uh, many of the younger generations of uh, Chinese consumers. And um, of course, if you look at this chart, you've got to remember. One thing is, in some years, people just don't want to get married, and <laughs> it could be something wrong said about, uh, you know, being said on the lunar calendar. Uh, in 2010, we see a slight decline in uh, new marriage registration. In the first half of this year, actually, we're seeing a bit of an increase, and um, we also are seeing uh, increased uh, levels of uh, platinum turnover in Shanghai Goat uh, Exchange, um, which is a fair indicator of the jury, jury, uh, I mean, jury company purchasing, because m much of that purchasing, you know, on that exchange was done by the jury companies um, and some of the industrial um, platinum users. So um, we um, we see that and uh, the uh, demand for um, uh, the fabrication demand for a platinum jewelry is likely to increase in the next couple of years because many of these uh, younger generation of uh, Chinese consumers, what we call the, the 80s, the post 80s generation, are uh, becoming marriable in the next couple of years, and this is a, going to be a supportive factor and the um, fabrication demand in uh, platinum. And um, so the auto sector is uh, the second largest consumer of platinum in the Chinese market. And China is uh, primarily a gasoline market, as uh, my colleague Eric has uh, briefly mentioned. Um, China now, of course, is, a, uh, is the largest auto market. And um, right now, it's, uh, I mean, auto sales in 2010 was uh, suited about 1.8 million units, and that's roughly 600,000 units more than the United States. And for this year, um, how, um, we are seeing, um, however, oh, um, the growth in uh, Chinese um, auto sales is likely to slow to um, between three and, and five percent, um, and because uh, mostly because of um, slower growth in the commercial vehicle sales. And uh, as we can see here, um, gasoline uh, gasoline vehicles right now stand uh, about eighty percent of the total cars that are being sold in China. And the rest of it um, are um, consumed. Uh, the rest of the sales are from diesel vehicle sales, and the, the platinum, of course, is more intensively used in diesel vehicles. Um, and diesel vehicles being sold in China are mostly commercial, so that means higher. Uh, uh, that means higher loadings because it's higher. Uh, it's a larger sized uh, engines. And growth. Um, of the Chinese vehicle sales in the past have been um, being fueled by increased sales of um, passenger cars. Um, it's uh, easy to look at the levels today, but uh, if you look back maybe 10 years before, Chinese vehicle sales was probably less than 10% of the total sales in the US. And that is really being fueled by increased um, private car ownership among the consumers. 
and we've been seeing like record, uh, I mean, uh, very high levels of sales uh, in the passenger cars for the past few years. And, uh, and last year in particular, because there were uh, government incentives in place, you know, such as subsidies for the rural consumers and old for new programs, and as well as some tax incentives for uh, the purchasing of the, the smaller size engine cars. And the um, growth in passenger cars in recent years, of course, have been fueled by an increased sales in the second, third tier cities and the rural areas, which are, you know, which are very, you know, uh, traditionally uh, uh, under, you know, un uh, like where traditionally ownership of cars has been low. Um, so um, in 2010, we've really seen a lot of the sales have been brought forward. And, and this, this is having an impact on the vehicle sales of this year. And uh, we also, in addition, we've also seen higher fuel costs, um, high inflation, which, you know, um, contain some of the consumer appetite for cars. Nevertheless, sales of passenger cars, cars um, for the first um, seven months of this year increased 5.9% um, year on year to about 8.1 million units. Um, what's really affecting growth, however, is the negative growth of commercial car sales, and uh, which fell by 4.7% uh, year on year to 2.5 million units in the first seven months. And that is uh, really a result of slower expansions of the Chinese economy and industrial activity, and as well as the tightening of the bank credits, with it, which is um, having an impact on, you know, um, car purchasings and also in addition we are seeing expansions of the railway um, freight carrying capacity you know very rapidly across China and that is having a certain Im impact on um, freight cars uh, freight car sales in China and um, of course um, the car engines um, the sizes of car engines are is a, it's a major it's a major factor in the PGM's demand, and um, currently in the passenger car market, we're seeing you know roughly 70% of the, all the passenger cars sold in China are below 1.6 liter, and that is you know uh, relatively small, smaller than you know what we've seen in engine sizes in developed economies. Uh, although in recent years, um, the growth in sales of SUVs have been um, largely, in, you know, outstripping sales of other uh, car categories, that remains a relatively smaller portion of the total Chinese auto sales, and so it's very unlikely that we are going to see like um, uh, car sizes reaching the levels of developed economies. And um, so, um, turning to emission standards in China, one thing you uh, the first one of the first things we've got to remember that is China hasn't really been implementing uh, the euro, you know, the equivalent of the euro, stand, euro emission standards since the, the very early this decade compared to what was, you know, being implemented in Europe early in 90s. And in 2011, China has begun to face in Euro 4 uh, standards in gasoline fuel light and heavy duty vehicles on a nationwide basis. Um, previously in Beijing, you know, uh, the facing was much earlier because of uh, the Olympics. And the, um, because of there are um, technical restrictions, um, the heavy duty diesel vehicles are expected to meet um, Euro 4 standards in early 2012. And um, the light duty diesel fueled um, vehicles are required to uh, phase in the standards in the second half of uh, 2013. And that, is, that means the, the tightening of the uh, the standards, emission standards for the for the platinum using diesel vehicle market is is slower than the rest of the uh, vehicle sectors, and that is uh, you know having a, that actually is getting translated into um, you know higher growth uh, in fabrication demand from the sector um, from palladium you know for palladium rather than. Um, platinum because palladium is more intensively used in gasoline fuel cars. And um, so talking palladium, uh, we are seeing uh, very strong growth 
in, uh, in fabrication demand for palladium. Um, in fact, uh, we are seeing uh, fabrication uh, demand for uh, palladium is expected to grow 4.5% um, to roughly 1.3 million ounces for this year, and this is really helped by the uh, growth in, in the auto sector, uh, which make up um, uh, which make up roughly more than half of 55% uh, of the total fabrication demand for uh, pal for palladium in China. Um, for, so um, palladium, and, so um, auto and electronics are the two sectors that are prim the primary consumers of palladium in China, of course. And that um, those two sectors consume about 75% of the total uh, palladium that has been consumed. Um, because we have higher um, gasoline car sales and tighter emissions in this category, uh, that is very, um, very positive for um, uh, growth and fabrication demand uh, uh, in the auto sectors uh, for palladium. And also in the electronic sector, as was briefly mentioned in previous presentation, we, um, the uh, thrifting of uh, the metal and the electronics uh, applications is very, is very limited because people have to use them in one way or the other. And um, what was being seen, however, since early um, to, to, uh, last, early in the last decade, was that the, uh, some of the electronics manufacturers were able to substitute palladium with uh, nickel and you know and other metals in multi-layer ceramic uh, capacitors and some of the you know niche applications, and that is having an impact on you know the electronics demand. Um, however, um, in this sector still, we are seeing you know, very strong growth because the overall volume growth and the Chinese electronics manufacturing. So um, that sector is uh, going to continue to grow for the uh, foreseeable, foreseeable period. I'm going to touch on another uh, usage of uh, palladium, and which is palladium jewelry. Uh, palladium jewelry is really being marketed as a small sister of uh, platinum jewelry. It, um, it, we are um, seeing palladium jewelry being marketed and consumed on a much larger level across the country. Um, starting in the early 2000s, um, that's when prices of platinum have increased and some of the jewelry fabricators started to look for a cheaper alternative. And because in, in those initial years, palladium jewelry was um, marketed was, was marketed sometimes intentionally with some confusion to platinum jewelry, and that has a, a bit of a negative effect on consumer perceptions. However, in the recent years, um, the consumers are better able to distinguish the differences between platinum and palladium, especially in the first uh, first tier cities where platinum is being platinum jewelry is being consumed. Palladium jewelry is uh, much more of a less costly alternative to um, platinum jewelry, and they're more intensively consumed in the second and third tier cities where consumers are more uh, price sensitive. And that is uh, one of the primary reasons we are seeing um, demand has um, uh, declined in 2010. And, uh, and this year, we are seeing a modest um, recovery of consumer demand. And going forward, um, um, the uh, demand for palladium jewelry is continued and going to continue to be capped by ele elevated inflation levels and, um, and the price you know, sensitiveness of the consumers. And um, with that, um, I'll wrap up my presentation. And um, if you're interested in rhodium, uh, um, okay, it's, it's, uh, I'll briefly mention that um, because uh, in rhodium is a smaller market and roughly 57, 60% of that demand comes from the auto sector. And this model is primarily using gasoline uh, vehicle markets. Um, and um, that is, um, you know, uh, consuming a lot of the metal, and it's going to keep uh, rhodium supported over the next few years. And um, so, um, any questions? Is jewelry uh, sold by piece or by weight in China? Um, that and that has to deal with the specific retailers and the sp specific uh, metal. With, with which you use to make the jewelry. For gold, it's sold by ounce. For silver, I've seen different, 
you know, different measures of cells. Some of, some of these are sold by ions, uh, actually by gram, golden, golden silver, or both cells sold by gram. And, uh, and some silver pieces, especially the lower end ones, are sold by piece. Um, platinum, uh, more so by piece. And palladium, I think, yeah, it's more by piece. Other questions? Um, okay, so I guess I'll um, turn the floor over to the next speaker.